Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa nakhaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru. Wa na'udhu billahi ta'ala min shururi al-Fusina wa min siyyati al-Amalina. Mi ahlahu fa'l-mudlala, wa mi yudlil fa'l-hadiyalah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahduhu wa ashadu an lahu la a'adil. ولا خوف لقوله ولا تبديل فأن حبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عبد الله ورسوله رسوله تعالى بالهدى والنخاق والثروة كله وكرهها في الروم اللهم أذكر شفاعة محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وأن صحت إنك أنت الرحمن وأنا الرحيم let me say it's a uh, privilege to be here with you right now. Um, I think some people say that my my voice is cracking up right now. Um, okay, uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, again, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa uh, Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. Um, and I'm um, pleased to be uh, with you in this virtual space for those of you who are in uh, the UK and I'm over here. Uh, in the United States of America. And uh, within the theme of discussions about uh, the importance of sabr, and excuse me for any redundancy in, in, uh, in some of the comments I'm going to make, considering I have not heard what's been discussed before, but I will be uh, speaking uh, specifically or primarily from uh, the story of one prophet of Allah which is Nabi Yunus and how his narrative in the Quran as well as what we've been doing in the Hadith uh, relate uh, to him and the lessons that we should be trying to uh, hopefully inshallah not only learn about intellectually but try to embody in terms of the uh, the spiritual virtue of patient perseverance, or what we call a sabr. Allah may Allah make us be the people who embody this noble character of sabr. First of all, we've been hadith as authentic to start off this <clears throat> narrated by Imam al Bukhari and also Imam Ahmad, may Allah's mercy be upon them, hadith as authentic. In which the Prophet says that uh, none, none of you should say that I am better than Yunus in that. None of us should say that we are being instructed by the Prophet that any of us are better than Nabi Yunus. Okay, it's saying still not clear. Um, has this uh, Better now that the video is off. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya al-mursaleen. Nabiyyana Muhammadin ala alihi wa sahihi wa tabi'ilhum bi khim sanayin mu'in wa'ayna ala ar-Rahman ar-Rahman ar-Rahim 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 ar-Rahim. So as I was saying, brothers and sisters in Islam, and again, despite the technical difficulties, that we all, as very briefly, focused on uh, Yunus Aislam, uh, Nabi Yunus Aislam, in regards to a lesson that we can derive about uh, sour or pace of perseverance. And then also, um, we will connect this also Nabi Yunus Aislam, uh, inshallah, uh, for our discussion. And this narrative, we we'll, hopefully we can have some lessons that we can learn from and there we go, and some suggestions about practical uh, steps about helping cultivate uh, stuff. So, uh, again, uh, in a authentic hadith that near Imam Bukhari and Imam Ahmed ibn Hibbumi Lazarus should be upon them, the army of Prophet Muhammad Ali has said that none of you who is a slave of Allah or no slaves. No one who is a servant of Allah should say that I am better than Yunus ibn Matta. 
obvious event. And from this, we learn uh, that a lot of what Jill said in the column as it relates to a, an error that is mentioned in other places in the Quran related to the uh, Yunus. When Allah was just about an hour of the shape of regime, possibly for me, a big letter, Kun Kasafi Bill Hood in the Wawa Mahlu. So Allah says, then be patient with the ruling of your Lord. And this is addressing to the Prophet Muhammad, be patient. Uh, from this thing, the ruling of your of your Lord or Prophet, and be not like the companion of the big fish when he called out when he was distressed. So <clears throat> now we can uh, learn bit that and there's pages behind uh, this this issue. So as we're told by uh, scholars of Castilla and uh, Ibn Kathir of money, which I will be referencing in terms of this, that we know that Nabi uh, Yunus was uh, commissioned by Allah as an adult to be a da'ya or to be a da'wah of his people. And, okay, it being copied again, I see that the camera is off. I will continue, inshallah. Uh, um, that uh, Nabi, Nabi uh, Yunus alayhi salam, he was, uh, he was commissioned to give da'wah to the people of uh, Nineveh. Nineveh is the province in Iraq, where the city of Mosul is um, located in the land with the provinces in Mosul, which was devastated by uh, extremists fighting there. So he was command give people power by like helping those people and so as I was saying previously we would like to just to touch on some of the lessons of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam in which our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that none of us should say that we are that we are any better than Yunus ibn Matah and we are told in the Quran in Surah Al Qalam, where Allah Azza wa Jal commanded our beloved Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam, Fasbir li hukmi rabbika wa la takun ka sahib al hut in nada wa huwa makzum. Where Allah Azza wa Jal commanded our beloved Prophet alayhi salam to be patient with the ruling of your Lord. O Prophet, and be not like the companion of the fish or the big fish when he called out while he was distressed. And the Mufassirin, the commentators of the Quran, are unanimous that this Sahib al Hut is Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him. So, from this ayah, as it relates to sabr or patience, let us then look back at. The, uh, the, the occasion behind Nabi Yunus alayhi salam and why Allah azza wa jal is commanding our Prophet alayhi salam um, to be more patient and persevering than a previous Prophet was in a particular situation. So Nabi Yunus alayhi salam was commissioned by Almighty Allah to give da'wah to his people who were in the region called Nineveh, or we also say Nineveh in the English language, in which this is, is, uh, it resides in that province. So this is where uh, he was commissioned to give da'wah to the people. And Nabi Yunus Salam gave Dawah, he called the people and called the people towards the worship of one God and to follow him. And those people, they did not accept his call, did not accept his Dawah after he had called them towards, um, towards the worship of one God. 
and Nabi Yunus salam, after seeing it, the people did not accept the call towards what he was calling them to. He, without having uh, bad intentions, without having the intention of disobeying Allah in a type of al-ajil or a type of haste, he gave up his mission of calling the people and then he left his people to go out on a, on a boat thinking that his people would be, those people would be halak or those people would be doomed or be ruined. So therefore he went to go get away from those people that he was calling towards uh, Islam who did not accept from his call. And as we are told, uh, and there's difference of opinion about, about this, uh, but we, we know that he went overboard and he went into the belly of the big fish or the whale, which is called al lahut in the Arabic language. There's a difference of opinion about how many days he actually was in the, the belly of this fish. There are some different opinions about this, but we can say that he was in, once he, once he went off of the boat, he went into three stages of darkness. He went into, first he went overboard in the, uh, in the Zumta uh, Layl, in the darkness of night. And then he went, not only the darkness of the night, but then he went under the darkness of the Bahar, of the sea. And then he went into the darkness of inside of El Hut, or the big fish, or the whale. And he was stuck in there, in the side, the, the belly of the, of the whale. Some say three nights, others say ten, others say forty. Wallahu alam, but Allah knows best the time period that he was in the belly of the big fish. And when Nabi Yunus salam came to the realization that the reason why he was actually in the belly of that big fish, it was because of his haste and that he confessed or understood that he was the reason why he was in the situation that he was in, in the three stages of darkness and the three levels of darkness. Then he said, La ilaha illa ant subhanaka inni kuntum min al-zalimeen. There is no God but you speaking to Allah. Glory be to you. And subhana means the, 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 the proclaiming of the tanzih of Allah Azza wa Jal, that he is transcendent and that he is free of making any errors. But thus, as, as, as creations of the creator, we can fall into mistakes and make errors. So he said, there is no God but you, O oh Allah. You are the one who is free from making any errors or, or, or committing any soul. And I am of a dhali mean. I am of those who are of the dhali mean. So this was the confession of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam. Once Nabi Yunus alayhi salam was freed from uh, the, uh, after, this, after this proclamation, after this dua, he was then freed from the belly of the fish. And then when he came back uh, to his people, then his people actually had accepted la ilaha illallah. Right? So there's lessons in this uh, for us. Now, let me deal with this issue of al-zulm in this context, or uh, al mean because he confessed that he was from the Dhali mean. And sometimes a Dhali mean is translated as oppressors or tyrants. Sometimes a Dhali mean is also translated as wrongdoers. But a Zulm also has another context in the Arabic language. And this is a specific context that I want to mention in regards to Yunus alayhi salam because there is one meaning of the more than one meaning of the term as zulm in the Arabic language. And in this particular context, it would be more fitting that, as is said by the scholars, that 
and a dhulma fi asilugati huwa naqsu wa dhalm. That in this particular context, a dhulm would mean in regards to the foundation to the Arabic language, it is a decreasement as well as a type of break or a, a thulm as a type of like rift, meaning that there's a space that's in between something or two things that would normally be connected at the proper at, at the proper time or uh, as they should be properly connected. So there's decreasement and actually uh, a rift. So in this particular instance of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam, it is not that he had the intention of committing wrongdoing or the intention of committing oppression, but that because of his haste, there and because of his haste with not having a bad intention, that there was a break between what he was commissioned to do and what he was supposed to do with his actual action. And this break between his mission and what he aspired to do and his action, it was because of a breakdown and him patiently persevering or for a period of time, him not exemplifying this, the, the characteristic of the sabr. Hence, this is why Allah Azza wa Jal had mentioned in the Quran uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so then be patient with the hukum or the ruling of your Lord and be not like uh, the companion of the big fish. Now, how does this relate to our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa Wasallam? <clears throat> how this relates is that after the year of grief, or, or Amr Huzn, it's called the year of grief, which took place in the in the Meccan period, and this year of grief is, is called this because first, Sayyidah Khadija bin Khuwailid Ranu Anha, the best of Umahatul Mu'mineen, she passed away. She died. And then Abu Talib, Abu Talib, who was the protector of the Prophet, وسلم, actually, who helped look after him after Abdul Muttalib passed away, um, his uncle, Abu Talib, passed away. So he was left without having the, his first believer and his first comforter, his beloved wife, as well as having his paternal uncle who also used to look after him and also used to give him protection from Quraysh. Both of them died. Then he went to a village not far away called at Ta'if. And he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, went with the young man that he raised like a foster son, Zayd ibn Haritha Radnawan. They went to a Ta'if, called the people towards Islam, and the people rejected Islam. They did not accept Islam. Then he asked for their protection, and the people didn't grant him protection. And just as it is narrated in some of the tafsir that Yunus alayhi salam went under three stages of darkness and was in the belly of the fish for three days, while our Prophet ﷺ was in At-Ta'if for three days until the Shabab, the youth of At-Ta'if, chased him out of town, throwing stones at him. Throwing stones at him. And after, afterwards, the Prophet ﷺ was met by an angel and said that your Lord has given you permission that the angel of the mountains, Malik al-Jibal, that he will, with, if, you, if you wish, if you want, with, with Allah's permission, that the angel of the mountain will come and render the, the, the mountains to come across these people and destroy these people for them not answering your da'wah, for not answering your call and how they reviled you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his patience said no. He didn't ask for the destruction because he had hoped that their offspring would say La ilaha illallah. Afterwards, there was one sympathetic man from a ta'if who sent 
his Christian slave from Nineveh, who was originally from Nineveh, a Christian slave named Adas, who came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with some food. And when the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam said Bismillah before eating the food, Adas said, this is strange because the people of this area, they don't mention God's name before they eat. And then later, as it came out in the discourse and the discussion between these two people, it was it was revealed that Adas came from the exact same city as Yunus ibn uh, 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 Yunus ibn Mata alayhi salam. And this interaction between Adas, the Christian slave from Nineveh, was a sign to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as well as a lesson to us about the patience that we need to have even when we're being reviled, even when things are uncomfortable, that we hold on to the ruling of Allah as a wajal, we hold on to his hukum, we hold on to his commands, and that we are we don't become uh, uh, people of haste. And, and give up our calling people towards our way and our path and thinking that we can take an easier, softer route and relinquish our Islamic teachings, relinquish our, our beliefs, and, 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 and we just give up calling people towards our sacred values and our sacred principles. Well, this is a very important lesson for us, brothers and sisters in Islam, especially with us who are living in the West, living in places like the United Kingdom, living in places such as the United States of America, that we don't give up our mission of da'wah. And, and that our position as Muslims, just like the prophets that came before and we follow their way, is that we simply call the people towards proper belief. And of course we do this with, with wisdom and beautiful preaching, as the Prophet was commanded, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but that we have to be patient and, and, and not abandon our call towards la ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah alayhi wa sallam. And by doing so, by, by uh, being patient and having sabr, this is something that is active. It's not simply a passive condition. But we should know this because we are not the ultimate determiners of outcomes. Allah is the ultimate determiner of outcomes. And he's maqalib al He is the one who can shift and change the hearts. But we're not going to necessarily be popular. People may not necessarily uh, accept when we want them to accept the message. Right? But but. All we are, what we are commissioned to do is we are commissioned to give the call. Now, just as Nabi Yunus alayhi salam had called the people towards proper belief and he ended up leaving them and came back and found them to have accepted belief, similarly the Prophet sallallahu alayhi, alayhi wa sallam, he didn't pray against those people of Ta'if and his hope is that one day those people their offspring would be upon Islam. And before the wafa, before the passing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those people of a ta'if accepted Islam. They accepted Islam. But he was patient. He didn't give up his mission. He didn't give up his da'wah. Nor did he pray against those people just because they didn't accept or just because they did harm. And of the prophetic dua of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that when he made dua for people, even when they rejected him, he prayed, Allahumma di qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. O oh Allah, guide the people, for surely they don't know. So this is the prophetic um, dua that we make as it relates to our da'wah and having patience and patiently persevering. Now, there's something else that I want to mention before we get to the question and answer uh, session, if if we if we are still able to facilitate that 
and obviously I can't read any of your comments. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, asta'inu bi sabri wa salah, inna allaha ma'asabirin. O those of you who believe, seek assistance through a sabr and salah. Surely Allah is with those people who embody sabr. Surely Allah is with the patient people. And many of the mufassirin or the exigents of the Quran, they say that in this particular ayah of the Quran, that a sabr means a song. It means fasting in this particular context. So, of course, we have the fast of the month of Ramadan, and that is obligatory. But beyond that, part of the spiritual exercise for us of cultivating patience is for us to fast and fast outside the month of Ramadan. And there's a philosophy behind fasting and fasting for us is a shield and it shields us away from acting off of our desires and acting upon our whims but also fasting is and one of the old meanings of fasting uh, linguistically in the arabic language is imsak means restraint that we are able to restrain ourselves from acting uh, whatever way we want to or restrain ourselves from acting in a way that would be hasty or a way that is the opposite of being uh, not persevering or, or not having patience. So we know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that outside of Ramadan that he would fast no less than three days of every Islamic month. So we should try to make this a practice that for us in our patience and in our da'wah, that our da'wah is more than just getting ilm. Yes, we have to have ilm. We have to have knowledge, right? And we know the Prophet said, that you convey from me, even if it's only a single ayah of the Quran. So yes, we have to have ilm. And, and, and yes, we should have good character or good khuluq in regards to our da'wah as well. But also in having patience is part of, and cultivating this patience as part of the inward work that we have to do in regards to the da'wah that we are involved in. And this has helped to be cultivated through fasting. So we should give ourselves the fasting to try to fast the 13th, the 14th, and 15th days of Islamic uh, Islamic months, or to fast Yom al-Ithnayn or Yom al-Khamis, to try to fast on Mondays and Thursdays as much as we can, but at least three days out of every uh, Islamic month. And I try to, to hold on to this. And to fast those special days on the Islamic calendar that our Prophet alayhi salam recommended for us, like, Yom Arafat, which is the ninth day of the next Islamic month of Dhu Hijjah, of fasting this day uh, on the 12th month, or fasting Yom Ashura, of fasting the 10th day in the month of Muharram, that we should fast also these special days, and these days have fadail or virtues that we don't have time to get into at this very moment. Now, in conclusion, I mentioned something about Nabi Daoud alayhi salatu salam. And some of the Arifina Billah, some of the Gnostics, there we have narrations in some of our books of actually some very saintly, saintly people, people who we would call Zahideen, people uh, who detached themselves from the dunya, these people who were utmost people in patience, that these people did the best fast. And the best fast is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Alaihi Wasallam said that the best fast is the fast of Dawood Alayhi Salam. And the fast of Dawood Alayhi Salam is he would fast one day and then he would break fast the next day. So he would fast one day and the next day he wouldn't fast. Then he would go back and fast the next day. And this is 
the best fast that one could do, but these are only of those who are of a high spiritual station uh, who, who, um, who are able to do this. This is outside of, of, the, of, of, of the capacity of most people, but there are people who have reached that level, and these are the people who have been able to do this, who have also been able to have patience, and not just patience in Dawa, but holding on patience to the command of Allah Azza wa Jal. And we know the patience of Dawood alayhi salam, and we've been told the stories of how he was patient in holding on to the command of Allah and believing Allah Azza wa Jal's promise, and especially as it relates to Dawood alayhi salam and his defeating of Jalut, of, of Goliath. So with that, uh, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, I am uh, again sorry for the for the uh, inability uh, to be seen via camera, and I'm not able to see uh, any comments right now. But I will uh, stop at this particular time for any uh, question for any questions that you may have uh, right now. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Zakla here for your uh, for your talk. Um, oh, there we go. Assalamu alaikum. Zakla <laughs> um, here for your talk. It, it, I, I particularly really really love the idea of Dawa, especially within the UK and um, and in you know in Western countries because at the end of the day everyone will get into contact with Islam and on the day of judgment they will have to. Can't hear anything. The oh, you can't. Oh no. I'm, I, yeah, I think my mic's on, so it might be the other way. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't hear anything she said. Okay, can you hear me now? Very faintly. Okay. Um. Try try some other ways, inshallah. We're really using some creative ways to make this happen. Yeah, I think it's just going to the headphones to um Islam alaikum. Can you hear me? Um, that's enough. Can you hear me? Uh, go ahead. I can hear you, but I can oh. hear her. Okay, you can't hear me. Um alaikum, can you hear me now? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi Yes, I can hear you. Alhamdulillah. Oh, brilliant. This is a very creative way uh, to communicate, Alhamdulillah. But <laughs> guess we'll have to make do, um, inshallah. I was just going to say, Jazakallah Khair for your talk. It was amazing. And it's so, it was like, it, it was so relevant to us, Alhamdulillah, considering we're all in, you know, Western countries and uh, Dawah is so important, not just through our speech, but also uh, being patient within that. And especially through our example like through the example of us and our behavior and our characters and actually uh, it's amazing that you mentioned fasting because it's something that I've personally been thinking about um and it's something that I've tried and it really really does help developing your patience and uh Zakhla had it's it's been you've given us such practical tips on how to um and how to develop our patient even further and how to and how to um develop our restraint um, so without further ado, um, Jazakallah for your talk again. It was honestly amazing. May Allah reward you. Ameen. Um, I'll go on to the first question. Um, how do we balance consistently and patiently giving dawah with not wanting to be overbearing to those we are trying to guide? I couldn't hear the question uh, clearly. I'm sorry. Can you, I'm can you repeat it, Akhi? I'm sorry. Or whatever she said. That's, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to need a, a, the, the brother to interface between what you asked me. Uh, I can't hear you clearly. I, you, you said something about balancing Dawa with something else. I couldn't hear the whole question. Um, Shahab, please could you um, repeat the question to, um, to our speaker, inshallah. Mark, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Excellent. Okay, uh, just read out the question number again, please. Okay, so Bismillah. 
Um, so how do we balance consistently and patiently giving dawa with not wanting to be overbearing with those who are trying to guide, with those we are trying to guide? This is an issue of, of, of having uh, wisdom, right? And there's not one easy answer that I can give, but Allah Azza wa Jal uh, commanded our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam the call to the way of your Lord bil hikmah wa ma'idat al hasanah, right? The call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and also beautiful preaching or beautiful uh, admonishment. Right, so uh, every single circumstance in which we interact with people is not 100% or nonstop preaching. So that's very important for us to understand. But um, the most effective dawa that we can do with with people one on one is actually to know them, right, and to know kind of like to learn their their sensitivities and their sensibilities. And this relates to the well-known saying that uh, Imam Bukhari narrated um, of, of, Ali, of, of Ali ibn Abi Talib where he said that you speak to people or preach to people according to their mentalities or the measure of like where they're at of, of their of their of their viewpoint right so um, our our individual interactions with people shouldn't be uh, nonstop, right? Uh, dawa opportunities, but when the when the when the opportunity of when we deal with people who aren't Muslims um, presents itself, that there's always a way that we can uh, tie in something to our deen. If we see an opening, then we can just say what Islam says, such an issue, and then we don't have to like. Uh, make it like a preachy thing, but just is something informative or educational. I think one of the bigger challenges for us as Muslims, uh, at least in America and Canada, is not necessarily the da'wah to people who aren't Muslims. It's, that's actually easier than the tablet or giving da'wah to people who are Muslims who have gone into a type of like Western secular types of understandings, right? Or uh, even I would call them uh, 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 the so-called woke mentality where they've taken on epistemologies or frames of reference of what is truth that's outside the Quran and Sunnah. That's actually a harder conversation to have, in my opinion. And with those particular people, um, sometimes in giving da'wah or talking to people like that who are Muslims is not necessarily addressing that which is on the surface about what they're saying but it's actually addressing the problems beneath the surface of the actual issues they're talking about. So I'll give you an example that uh, if someone is uh, amongst us and they reject the, the idea of gender equity from a Quranic perspective that women have been given certain fadal over men that men don't have, but men have also been given certain fadail over women that women don't have, generally speaking, and this is how the balance is set. If someone thinks that women and men have to do everything exactly 100% the exact same way as, as Muslims, then this is an issue not of the facial issue of gender, is, uh, of, 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 of gender and how they understand things about maybe feminism within the Western context, but what really needs to be addressed actually is actually an Aqidah issue. It's an Aqidah issue of having to explain to them like, what does the oneness of Allah really mean? Or what what does the divine name of Al Adil, uh, of the one that is just, the one who set the balance of all things, he who put everything in its proper place as it needs to function, uh, there has to be a discussion about this from a Tawhidi perspective before even getting to the superficial uh, issue or, or, or the surface issue. And that's um, uh, a harder, that's, that, that takes 
um, I think ex some experience and some uh, Islamic learning to uh, address people uh, like that they are dealing with these types of uh, epistemological uh, types of, uh, of misunderstandings. And Allah knows best. Can I ask you? Do we move on to the next question, inshallah? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, can you hear us? Uh, yes, Shab, do you want to read the question out? Is that easier for you, or do you want to for Noel to read the question out? Yeah, it's better if you read the question to me. Yeah. Okay. Shab, can you can you read the question from the screen? Would it be easier for you? Bismillah. So, um, did the Prophet, mm, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, first of all, checking, can everyone still hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. So, did the Prophet sin, quote-unquote, or are certain actions considered mistakes or errors? Okay. So, in this particular context, and we're talking about Yunus Ali Salam, this is similar, there's a similar statement that Nabi Adam السلام, made and also Nabi Yunus I mean Nabi Musa السلام, similar statements and this is why I went into uh, one of the definitions linguistically of zulm and how zulm has a different meaning or a wider meaning than just wrongdoing or just oppression so when we look at Adam السلام, after uh, his uh, mistake with 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 Hawa Ali has salam, he said, Rabbana Dalamna and Fusana, like oh uh, uh, our Lord, we have committed zoom upon ourselves. Similarly, when Nabi Musa Ali has salam saw one of his people fighting with an Egyptian, and then Musa came and he hit the Egyptian and he unintentionally killed the Egyptian with a hit. He said, Rabbi inni zalam tu nasi faqfirli. My Lord, most certainly I committed zulm upon myself. So please forgive me. So these are statements that Adam السلام, made this statement. Yunus السلام, made this statement. Musa السلام, made this statement. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a similar dua and authentic hadith allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi dhulman kathira wa la yaghfiruhu dhunuba illa anta faghfir maghfiratan min indik warhamni innaka anta ghafur rahim o allah most certainly i have committed zulm upon myself with much zulm and there is none who can forgive except for you so please forgive me and have mercy upon me Surely you are the forgiver and the merciful redeemer is the dua of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now in our in our creed, we believe that the prophets of Allah were given what's called al isma that they were that they were protected, meaning that they were protected from the intention or from the niya of disobeying Allah. Did prophets commit uh um, um, unintentional errors or unintentional mistakes, yes, but it was not in the nature of the prophets to rebel against the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal. And we know that this is part of Allah Azza wa Jal's tenzi, and I mentioned this earlier with the meaning of Subhana or Subhanallah. When we say Subhanallah, Subhanallah, the Subhan, La ilaha illa Subhanaka inni kuntum min al-zalimin, the dua of Yunus alayhi salam. That it is only Allah Azza wa Jal who has ten Z or who has transcended from making any mistake. Human beings uh, aren't Allah, right? So, but the, the, the difference is, is that the prophets, unlike us, we will commit mistakes unknowingly, but we also have all done things wrong knowingly. Whereas the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such as, such as Musa alayhi salam, such as Isa alayhi salam, such as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, 
they did not intentionally uh, rebel against the commands of Allah. So their, uh, the mistakes that prophets made are not like the sins that you and I made because we're not masumi. We don't have Islam. Okay, Okay, we can This goes back to the well. It, it depends on who you're talking to, right? So this also goes back to. Oh, sorry. Assalamualaikum. I'm sorry. Assalamualaikum. I'm sorry. Um, the audience actually didn't uh, hear the question, and I'm guessing. Uh, inshallah, Shahab, please correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, when giving dawah or simply defending Islam against non-Muslims, how do we answer the question of why there is evil in the world? Is this the correct question? Correct. Yeah. Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, yes. now everyone's heard it. Okay, jazakallah. Carry on. Okay, so when we're talking to people, and I would say this is a general issue, because it's it's hard to call people to what the Quran says when they don't even believe in the Quran, right? So this is more of an issue of where we are telling people something out of wisdom, and what we what we would say to them. And then my suggestion is in answering this question is that Almighty God is a creator and he created uh, us as human beings and he gave us a level of free will to make choices and we call this ikhtiyar right that we have a level of free will that we can make choices and that a lot and that almighty god when he created us he gave us the capacity that we could act uh, in good ways or act in bad ways and this is the type of free will that he created as human beings of being vicegerents in the earth, but that uh, Almighty God is not pleased with 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 wrongdoing or with evil. But he allows certain things to to go on and take place, and this is part of the test that he gives in human beings to see who are those who wanna uh, who are gonna rise up and do the right thing, and then those who are the people who are immorality who commit mischief in the land but it goes back to the issue that there is uh evil that exists in the world it is not that almighty god is pleased with evil nor that he desires people to act in evil ways but it is he who is the creator who uh gave us uh our our our, our free will so that's the way that i would uh address that but allah knows best <laughs> 